So good afternoon. Welcome back to the WaveX seminar and welcome for those who have started to join us now. We are going to start session three about opportunities promoting a sustainable blue economy and our moderator will be José Chambel Leitão, who is managing partner of Hydromod. Uh, we would like to invite all speakers of the session to join José and open your cameras and to prepare your presentation, please. Sorry. Hi, good afternoon. Sorry. Hi, everyone. Hello. Can you hear me? Loud and clear, I hope. Okay, Jeanette, should we start or uh, should we have to wait for someone? Let me see if we have the panel complete. So we're just missing Paulo Serra Lopes, but you can start with the first two speakers. Okay. Uh, okay. Welcome. welcome to this session. Um, what are the opportunities out there? Uh, what can be seized? For uh, people who have a lot of money, they don't have anything to do with it. Uh, where can they put uh, their money? Can they can they put their money already on these technologies? Uh, I think this is what our panelists are going to uh, to tell us, and uh, to uh, uh, so that we can learn a bit more on 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 uh, on, on some of these technologies. Uh, I, I'm uh, I'm uh, José Chambelito. I'm from Hydromod, a, a small consultancy. Um, who uh, is dedicated uh, to uh, uh, numerical modeling and uh, data science and uh, information technologies. Uh, our vision is that uh, with this increasing use of the marine water resources um, and with the increasing um, uh, um, improving of knowledge, businesses that depend on these environments will be more productive, safer and sustainable if they incorporate that knowledge in planning and operations, uh, and I think this is uh, this uh, uh, we saw this in 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 this morning presentations, and I believe that we will see that now. Um, we we are going to have uh, now first uh, Miguel Patena. Uh, Miguel is the Innovation Technology Director in EDP Produção. He manages several innovative projects, in particular floating photovoltaics and storage applications for solar and geographical isolated electrical systems, hybrid systems and hydrogen. He is also responsible for the international division in EDP Produção, dedicated to consultancy services. Previously, he managed the engineering team responsible for the design of the conventional generation fleet in EDP Produção, mainly hydro. Miguel, go ahead. Okay, I hope you can see my screen already. So yes, thank yes, you. Yes, perfect. It's perfect. Thank you, Jose, for the nice introduction. Thank you, Wayback, for the kind invitation as well. It's a pleasure for me to be with this uh, distinctive panel, and I hope you can bring you some perspectives on this uh, floating solar. So I've uh, prepared this presentation slightly different perspective what we have seen today. So. Uh, um, expecting that most of the audience will know already what is floating PV. So I'll get more on the business side of how we're using floating PV on how you call it, inland offshore. <laughs> and then perhaps I will, and I'll bring some perspectives of what is uh, um, floating PV sea offshore. Okay, so these two kinds of offshores that we, we will find. And why this business, as uh, Jose Chambel said, previously, uh, it's important to have this business perspective to see, uh, to drive or to push the technology to, to thrive and, and to, to go through and to make uh, further improvements and to step out from this uh, more um, development phase or investigation on R&D phase. So it's very important to, to bring uh, a significance for these projects. So it's what is drivers to search for these um, niche opportunities. 
um, don't forget the EDP production is a um, within EDP company is a company responsible for the hydro plants and also thermal plants. We have about six gigawatts in hydro plants installed with uh, three gigawatts of pump hydro. So hydro for us is a very important asset and will make uh, will uh, we call it provide uh, we call it flexibility for the our markets with the high increase of renewables. And so we have all these um, objectives from the EU, which will be this 80% uh, electrical consumption must be from renewables. And also EDP has in these uh, objectives to have 90% of the portfolio uh, renewable by 2030 as well. And so we saw in Portugal that this auction for conventional uh, PV is driven to world records for low prices. And we have seen this last year and this year, prices as low as 13 euros per megawatt hour on PV. And so this makes, why do I, why do I bring this to you? Is because this makes life harder for the other uh, renewable technology as well, because they have somewhere to compete, somewhat to complete, compete with this um, uh, technology that are more mature, renewable mat uh, mature technologies. And so what, one thing that we're going to change dramatically in Portugal in the next years will be the price, uh, as we have a marginal price, price design and market. And the, what we see in this screen is that um, now this black curve is the, the price, um, the, 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 the price profile in a normal, let us say, month. Um, in January 2040, we'll see in the win uh, winter in Portugal, we'll see this curve already changing slightly and decreasing on the Sundays, where this yellow part will be the, the investments we're going to have in solar in Portugal. And then in July and summer periods, we'll have more or less zero prices in during daytime and even a negative, I've seen or I see some perspectives um, of having negative prices for for during daytime. And so this changed completely the way the wind uh, appears. And that's why we call the hybridization. I've seen in some presentations also mentioning hybridization in the different context. What this will make is perhaps as an example for future applications, which are not yet that mature, but will benefit from more mature technologies that can be hybridized with. So this is the, we call it, uh, nothing new we have a complementary obvious complementarity between solar and and, and rain and water so hydro plants and sun are complementary and not only complementary in terms of um, resources so sun and water resources but also on the lines that exist already the connection points in portugal and within europe is a scarce resource so we don't have connection points to to fit in our renewables and the amount of renewables that we're going to expect next years. And so having an existing line in a plant, it's the first step to go in into a, a new renewable. So to hybridize what we call hybridization with these conventional renewable assets. And so it will benefit and point of view of, uh, I call it economically, technically, and also an environmental point of view. So in a holistic perspective, we'll be using existing resources to push in with the new technologies. And why this makes sense in the hydro power uh, and hybridized with hydro generation is because in Portugal, we have uh, an hydro plant is normally roughly equivalent to 2,000 hours, 2,000 equivalent hours per year. Um, it's not the same in Brazil, for instance, they can go or runoff river 8,000 hours per year. But in Portugal is what it happens and in some, most of the countries in Europe. And so what it will mean is that this gray area will be the available transmission line capacity that we can use for other uses, like this solar, for instance, with this equivalent uh, amount of energy with a 500 megawatt plant, we could hybridize with solar and being able to cope with also this gray area for availability of the line. And also, if the pump, if we have a pump, um, hydro pump, a pump, uh, pump turbine unit, 
most of the solar can be used with pumping, benefiting from the lower prices that they've seen before. And so this still will have 4,000 hours equivalent operating hours at full load in the line to be hybridized with something else. And so this means um, what we have, we have um, made an example for um, on the north of Portugal, we see these uh, yellow curves with the solar profile and we see the gray area. It's the hydro profile with the pump storage, a, long, a large capacity pump storage, but with low power output. And what we see today is that the, the um, operation collides with the solar profile, which means that we have, uh, I call it, they concur for the same price in the market. But we'll see in 2040 that will change. So if you see this uh, solar profile and the generation profile and pump, we we'll see that the pump mode will go on top of the solar profile. And so it means that the, we'll adapt the generation to hours when we don't have sun. And then this is simply an example of the benefiting of the price difference. So that's why we, we want this as um, an example. And also we, can, we, we could hybridize with wind, not only sun, but with wind. But wind, we have an, a different um, challenge because wind resources is much more, we call it um, correlated with the water resources or rain in Portugal. So in the winter time, the profiles are similar and the, the, therefore the, the opportunity to hybridize is less. But of course, this will require sophisticated control systems that need to, to match uh, this use of the same line without exceeding power. This is a limitation that we have in our regulation. So the more, intermittent um, renewable energy we install in these lines, the more complex is to manage and to dispatch this, or I call it this group of, um, of existing uh, installations. And so for instance, in our case study, we have this water, water flow in, in uh, this river in Alto Rebagão in the north of Portugal, where we install our first hybrid um, floating solar. We have made some calculations that uh, we know that by increasing the wind, we'll, uh, of course, we can enableize the hydro generation, whereas um, solar is more compatible. So we could increase in power in solar, but less in wind. And so this is just uh, some highlights of the complexity of the studies that we have to do in order to optimize this um, hybridization potential. And so we have, uh, this shows the, the losses that we have in the system by hybridizing a lot, uh, an amount of, a uh, large amount of hydro and solar. And, um, and so what we have found so far in this investigation is that of course, solar is much easier to hybridize with hydro and wind is more, uh, more, we call it more correlated with hydro, so therefore the potential is less, at least in Portugal. But this opens a perspective when we are in this uh, seminar with uh, calling, um, talking about sea offshore. Of course, all these technologies that are offshore can be then hybridized with existing plants that are near shore and benefiting for the um, existing um, infrastructure, electrical infrastructures, and locally. Uh, virtual power plants or a local dispatch. And so this all also benefits for the community perspective of dispatching on a community level, uh, because normally we are talking on lower capacity or lower uh, power um, capacity installation in the renewables on the sea. And so what uh, we have uh, as a perspective for the floating solar and to bring more on this, um, you'll be expecting to hear. We are planning a four megawatt Alkeva plant. Is, uh, a four megawatt is four hectares in Alkeva Dam is in the south of Portugal. It's 
nearby. So we have here Lisbon, Alkiva is here, is one of the larger um, reservoirs in, in Iberia. And so we are going to install a, a floating platform that bring us some very important challenges I want to share with you, which are being tackled with this uh, European Maritime, Maritime and Fisheries Fund, the MFF, in the, we call Fresher program, with some partners, including WAVEC, that is participating in this program. And we are in the, in the a situation, it's uh, offshore inland, uh, but with a very, I call it uh, open area, water surface with a lot of implications on uh, wind forces, uh, water level variations, which is very, very big, and also safety aspects that have to be tackled within the hydro plants. If we installed this type of floating devices near a safety uh, organs like this, water, water sp spillways, this is always has to be taken into consideration in the calculation of the mooring design. And so we have a lot of variation that expose um, levels into above water surface. So there has to be designed accordingly the, all these uh, um, mooring systems. And of course, water speed, which is this dark blue, will be a higher speed near the near the speedways. I hope you see the animation. You can see the animation. This is the the project we have in Alto Rebagão. It's in north of Portugal. It's a, it's a 220 kilowatts. It's a, a small, but it's, you can see here the the demanding side uh, zone that we expect also on the, on the south of Portugal. With, we have one meter waves um, and 60 meter water depth and 30 meters water variation on the level of the reservoir. So what they've used is we have flexible C-flex cables and an anchoring system that was very quite complicated to do because it's a very, it's a granite, uh, granite granitic area. And um, this made a very important uh, record challenges. And so just a reflection for perhaps we would like to discuss. We have seen this, um, wind going offshore or sea offshore and this is a very known picture about this uh, uh, going to from onshore to offshore and the size and some questions have been raised in some forums about the floating pv where is we should go to sea offshore or not and so the question we have raised all is the following we have moved wind from onshore to offshore because we have more wind resources that compensate the higher cost and complexity of the systems. Whereas in, in uh, PV, uh, offshore inland and offshore sea offshore, we are just increasing complexity and not increasing solar resource. So the point is, whereas you, we move to the sea, perhaps only when we, the scarcity of land or scarcity of uh, inland water surface will be, will be a problem. And so we have a different problem to, to issue. Here we have more wind resources, and so allows for more investment and complexity. And in sun, we don't have more sun resources on sea than on land. And so why we're going to move is just because of scarcity of land. So with this, I'll, I'll finish just with this remark. So hybridizing intermittent renewables is a complex task that has to be checked case by case and moving from inland onshore or sea offshore on terms of pv it's a, a nice thing that we want to to solve but uh, perhaps we only want to, we only need to solve when we have a problem or scarcity of space and so with this i hope i i got in my 15 minutes jose please yes you did thank you sharp okay. 15 minutes sharp thank you very much miguel uh, um, the questions will be at the end and please do start filling in those questions for miguel um so now let's move on to um to the presentation from kendra mcdonald um 
Are you here? I am here. Give me a second. Hopefully I am appearing. Okay, yes. And now Welcome. I am trying to share my screen. Hold on. Kendra McDonald is the CEO of Canada's Ocean Supercluster, responsible for driving innovation and growth in the ocean economy. Kendra was previously a partner in Deloitte risk, Deloitte's risk advisory practice and the chief audit executive of Deloitte Global. Kendra speaks regularly on the topics of innovation, future of work and disruptive technologies and also serves on the board of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce and is the past chair of the Newfoundland and Labrador Association of Technology Industries. Um, uh, and now the screen is yours, Kendra. Excellent, thank you. Hopefully you can see me and the screen. Yes, it's perfect, yes. Excellent. Uh, so it's truly my pleasure to be here uh, and to be part of this conversation and to see some, some familiar faces. Um, you know, as we look at some of the significant, most significant opportunities for growth, uh, you know, we, we can certainly look to the ocean and the oceans uh, predicted to outpace other sectors in terms of uh, growth in the global economy. I think I'll, I'll bring a different perspective. I'm going to talk a little bit about what the supercluster is doing and how we invest in projects and some of the projects that we have underway. I've had the opportunity to uh, participate in a couple of the panels earlier, uh, so I think it, it'll be a, just a, a different perspective than some of the earlier, earlier discussions. So what I want to do is start with a quick video, if the technology works which talks a little bit about Canada's ocean opportunity and, and the role that Canada's ocean supercluster can play. And I think builds on some of the discussion earlier with both the ambassador and uh, the representative from Marine Renewables Canada. So if we can play that video. Carolina, Carolina can you give us a help here? <laughs> Okay, hopefully you have me back and the screen back. Yes. Perfect. That's great. Excellent. So, so Canada's Ocean Supercluster is one of five superclusters in Canada, and really uh, the supercluster program was put in place to, to change the way Canada invests in innovation and its innovation reputation. 
Our purpose is really to grow the Canadian economy in specific areas where it was felt that, that Canada had a real opportunity globally. And so Ocean was one of, the, one of those. And as you heard, one of the things that we're really trying to do and what was really special about the, the, the Ocean Supercluster was this idea of cross-sectoral collaboration. So bringing together sectors that had previously not worked together. So in the past, a lot of the sectors solved their own problems, whether it was fishery or aquaculture, uh, offshore resources, et cetera. And what we found is there was a lot of commonality in the challenges that were facing those companies, in particular when it came to reducing the cost and risk of doing business on the ocean, as well as when we look to the workforce of the, of the future and the need for both digital skills and a more inclusive workforce. And so we really brought together uh, organizations that hadn't worked together before, sectors that hadn't worked together before, and they're starting to pull together solutions uh, to these shared, uh, shared challenges that are relevant to the world. And so that's incredibly exciting for us. We're a co-investment model. So we are industry led and what we're really trying to do is encourage industry to invest in innovation and innovative solutions like some of the ones that we've been talking about today and certainly in the renewable space to be able to um, help encourage that investment but also de-risk some of that investment for, for industry. When we look at last week and what we heard with the high level panel for sustainability, it's put healthy oceans at the top of the global policy agenda. And as we hear, and we've heard it several times today, this $3 trillion opportunity that exists for doubling the ocean economy by 2030, that's happening at a time when our oceans are already under tremendous pressure. And so this is not a conversation about, you know, the, the how we grow our ocean versus manage ocean health. This is really a conversation about how do we deal with these two competing, in some cases, priorities to be able to um, maximize our future prosperity. And so one of our key roles as we look to the ocean for every second breath we take is to really raise the awareness for all Canadians. I don't know how familiar you are with Canadian geography, but a lot of our Canadian population actually sits in the center of the country. So as much as we have 11 provinces that touch the ocean, a lot of our population is actually closer to freshwater and further away from, uh, from our coasts. So as you heard, the, Canada has the longest coastline in the world. We also have some of the harshest marine environments and we have lots of untapped potential with you, which you heard both in the conversation with the ambassador as well as Marine Renewables Canada talking about um, the potential for offshore wind. From a super cluster perspective, we, uh, so I started my role a couple of years ago for about two and a half years into a five year, initial five year mandate. We now have almost 350 members. Um, we, when COVID and the pandemic started in March, what we found was our companies were being very hard hit uh, by the pandemic in terms of our ocean sectors. When we look at, you know, fisheries demand or offshore oil and gas, for example. And so we ran a, a call program back in March uh, to be able to try to continue to encourage uh, investment in innovation, innovation projects. We looked at smaller scale, smaller timeline projects, and we focused those projects on areas like remote operations and digitization and environmental technologies. All of these tie very well into marine renewables. And that generated a lot of activity, which has resulted in us moving from six projects back in March to now 42 approved projects. Uh, that we're working through now uh, with a total value of, um, of around $200 million. So we're pretty excited about those and the level of activity that we've seen. One of the things that we did start very early on was Canada is a big country and so we didn't actually know what we know and so if you're trying to build on capability and you don't know what's there, it's, it's hard to do that. And so we wanted to build connection across the country and that was through our um, ocean asset project. And you can actually find it on our website and it shows um, over 4,000 organizations across Canada. It's an interactive map. Maybe not surprisingly, you can see a lot of concentration on our East Coast and our West Coast, but that has really helped both international partners navigate the Canadian landscape and ocean, as well as our Canadian companies to be able to go looking for each other, uh, leveraging that map. 
And so when we look to some of our projects, so we've been very busy. We announce projects uh, as they're contracted. And so we've been very busy getting projects contracted uh, so that we can share them with the public and all the exciting things that are happening. Just wanted to highlight a few. So we have two key types of projects. So one is technology leadership. Our technology leadership uh, projects, maybe not surprisingly, are focused on developing new technologies or moving technologies along uh, TRL levels. What we're really trying to do is, com is encourage commercial outcomes. So we've got lots of phenomenal research across Canada. One of the things that Canada is weaker at is commercializing their research. And so that's really what we're trying to do. And so our technology leadership projects are focused on doing that. That's where the bulk of our spending is. And maybe a few of those to highlight. So we have our Ocean Vision project, which is very much focused on autonomous vehicles and data collection, which is very important when you get into whether it's marine spatial planning or whether it's being able to you know, do different inspections. This is all technology that is helpful with that. Our Ocean Aware project is actually a $29 million project. It's got 11 different partners and it's looking at fish movement around subsea structures when it comes to energy. It's looking at fish health when it comes to aquaculture and how to make sure that you're ma maximizing fish health, as well as fish movement in the wild fishery. So you can see again, several sectors coming together with some ocean technology partners to be able to uh, develop, develop solutions that are relevant to more than one partner. We've had more, as you heard, we don't have as much in terms of offshore wind. We have some tidal activity. We see a lot more, whether it's in, uh, as an example, our smart protective coatings from a sustainability perspective. So that project is looking at, it's a coating for vessels that reduces leaching into the water, as well as being able to reduce uh, drag and therefore fuel consumption and, and a reduction in GHG emissions. So that gives you a sense of some of the technology projects we have underway. Our innovation ecosystem is a smaller spin, uh, but it is really focused on looking at gaps in our ecosystem. How do we strengthen those, strengthen our overall ecosystem and therefore our ocean economy? So a couple uh, in that space. So one is just around, around data. So we're working with the Canadian Integrated Ocean Observing System, which I guess is part of the, the global, uh, the, G, the GOOSE, the Global Ocean Observation System. How do we get data out of our projects that, that wants to be shared? They have a mandate to, to share ocean data. Ocean data is a key part of sort of better, better decision making in our collaborative projects. So we've been working with them to raise awareness around um, the value of data and the potential for data and how companies can leverage that data. We also have projects focused on inclusion. So our Blue Futures Pathway project is looking at trying to connect 2,500 youth uh, between 18 and 30 to potential ocean opportunities. Our Ocean Allies project is gathering data on the current state of our workforce so that we're able to put some programs in and then measure their impact on inclusion. And our startup project is actually looking at a few different things. So one, they actually ran an ocean challenge, which attracted 158 companies, uh, startups from around the world, with potential solutions to Canadian ocean challenges. They also have a lab to market program, which is very specifically designed to work with researchers to help them understand how to commercialize their research. And thirdly, our creative destruction lab, which also has specific programming in a specific ocean cohort that draws about 75% of their companies uh, from around the world with, with ocean solutions. So with that, you know, we're, we truly are just getting started. <laughs> we're, we're a couple of years in, but we really see that we play a key role in continuing to sort of incent innovation across companies. And we're very broad in terms of what we cover. And so I think we're going to continue to see more and more um, projects that are focused on Various, like you saw, we, we don't have sort of tidal project in a, uh, an offshore wind project, but we have complementary digital projects that are really able to bring some very specific skills of relevance to those areas. And I think there's lots of opportunities and, and synergies based on what I've heard to be able to work with Portugal. Uh, it's unfortunate <laughs> that I can't be there in person, would love to be, but I think this is a great way to be able to connect virtually and continue to share. I think we see 
you know, international partnerships. I think the ambassador said it earlier, the more that we can work together, all the oceans are in interconnected. And so I believe that the partnerships globally just strengthen the overall solutions that we can develop. So I'll stop there. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Kendra, for your presentation. Um, so now let's move on to um, Paulo Serra Lopes from Oceanic Motion, Aquasor. Uh, Paulo, are you with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. So Paulo is a marine biologist, postgraduate in aquaculture in Taiwan, first director of the Lisbon Oceanarium, CEO of Oceanic Motion, a company investing in innovation and ocean technologies in the Azores, and board member of Aquasor, the leading aquaculture company in Azores. So, Paulo, uh, you can start your presentation. Thank you. Yes. Okay, here we go. Well, um, good afternoon to everybody. <clears throat> can you hear me? Hello, Jose, can you hear me? Yes, uh, can you switch on your video, your camera? Uh, yes, I can. It should be. It's better that people see you. Okay, how should I do to, to have both you and, and uh, the screen? Show my you, screen. You, you, in, Hi, Paul. Have to do, uh, that's uh, that's, um, uh, that's getting through now. Uh, now it's just your camera. Now now you see? You see yes, yes, we are seeing the presentation, yes. Okay. All right. I, I'm not sure if we can see the video on the end of the presentation, but if we can't, okay. no, it doesn't matter. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Well, um, <clears throat> Azores, uh, as you may know, are uh, tiny little islands belonging to Portugal in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Are you seeing me? Sorry, because I keep. Yes, yes, we are just not seeing your my... face, but we are seeing the presentation. Okay, all right. So uh, basically, uh, the Azores had never in the past developed any attempt for aquaculture. And in 19, in 2016, we started a, a new company named Aquazor to start to develop um, aquaculture, innovative ideas in the Azores. First of all, we had to bring with us local fishermen's association because they were lacking a lot of jobs with the, the, the huge decay of, uh, of fisheries. So we thought it would be a good idea to cope up with them and have a local fishermen's association with us. And also uh, the Azores University, who has been very helpful in developing some of the projects we are doing now, mainly with fish and with the uh, seaweeds. Um, we started the fish with uh, a local species, Greater Hamburjack, a very well-known species for the fisheries. And uh, um, we had uh, a good start with the project uh, called Diversify uh, that European Union brought until 2018. And uh, uh, there was a, quite a, a degree of knowledge from that project. And we believe this species called generally Seriola can be the salmon of the southern Europe. Uh, it can grow and we are betting um, all our effort in, in aquaculture of, of fishes in this species. We started with the offshore submersible cages because the Azores is such a bad weather uh, location. Uh, in fact, I believe we are the most exposed location of all the this type of submersible cages. And up to now, everything was fine. We can, uh, we can just uh, <clears throat> put the cages to minus 20 of the surface so we can avoid most of the surface bad weather. And uh, um, I believe that's really the, the way to go 
not near shore, but to the to the deep. And in the deep, we are much more protected than on the near shore. Well, uh, in 2017, we started our projects with uh, a special uh, grant from European Union, exactly on innovation in aquaculture. Nothing had been done in the Azores before our initial um, aquaculture venture, so um, it's, it, it was uh, a challenge to install everything. We have a small hatchery operating and uh, one offshore cage uh, specifically on Seriola, Great Amberjack. Well, the, the, the hatchery is, has been developed to produce juveniles of 30 to 40 grams, which are the, is the minimal weight and size to be able to uh, get to the fish cage. We now have a broad look of our, uh, our facility. And uh, <clears throat> this is one of our girls feeding the, the small fry. They leave the, the hatchery when they are between 30 and 40 grams. And then uh, they are kept in our uh, offshore cage until three to five kilos. We are now harvesting our first cycle. We have already fishes of five kilos, but we have uh, quite a dispersion of, of sizes that go from two and a half kilos to four and a half at this level. But uh, that is quite normal for, for uh, Seriola. So we can supply different markets with the, the at the same time, uh, not only the Japanese uh, gourmet market that requires bigger fishes, but also other markets that require smaller fishes. Um, once this, uh, a vision of the cage when it's in the bottom. The top of the cage is about 15 meters below surface. Um, now, uh, we have two main um, needs of energy in this cage. We have to float the cage to surface and we have to uh, feed the fish in the cage when it's in the deep. Uh, both actions require energy. And we thought, in in such a with such a distinct audience, we may find a partner to help develop with us these energy needs. Our goal is in the future be completely independent on Earth, on on land. We would like to make real, really uh, offshore aquaculture without any dependence from the the from the land which means that we would have to have our our feeds in a floating barge exactly like you already do with salmon and all our energy uh, produced on the spot so that we could be completely independent from uh, the surface um, my presentation is perhaps uh, a challenge for some of the companies that are present in this uh, webinar and uh, that may want in the future to uh, start with us this uh, innovative uh, proceeding, which is basically uh, getting us independence from the land. And um, the, the, the type of energy we require is not so important. Uh, we use usually a compressor that's staying on a boat, and this compressor uh, just fills uh, an hollow center of the cage with compressed air. And that's how we float it, taking out the air, it goes to, to, to the deep, and it's a very simple procedure. And I believe we could achieve easily an alternative way uh, of producing energy for this. Also, another need of energy is really the seawater pumps that we use to feed the fish. You see now a feeder, the feed is introduced here, a pump uh, just pumps water from the sea and uh, takes it to the cage uh, so that the fish um, are fed daily. Usually we feed them twice daily. Well, could we operate and produce fish offshore independent from 
any energy source in land, I believe, we believe we could, and that's perhaps the most challenging uh, question I would leave to the audience. If someone in the audience can and will help us, we do have very good um, research efforts in the Azores. We have um, also a good support from European Union in the next 10 years. There is uh, Mark 2030, which will have probably um, some millions on, on money for innovation in aquaculture. Um, we believe that we can find a solution in tidal energy or any other source of, uh, of um, capturing the energy from the waves and from the ocean and perhaps store it. I would guess something like this. This is just a, a, um, a drawing taken from uh, many works done but it could represent what we were looking for. And uh, in fact, um, we think we can offer uh, absolutely amazing conditions. We, we are in a very uh, nice environment in the middle of the Atlantic. And we really think that Azores can operate as a marine lab because it has a lot of potential to the development of the blue economy. We also um, can inform that we will do another cycle of trial with a single cage and then we will expand to uh, six to ten cages. We would love to have some energy sources offshore to this uh, future uh, six to ten cages step, which is in fact our goal. So um, again, we welcome any partnership that may want to research power generation and storage in the sea with us. And thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Are you seeing the video now? No. No? Okay, because uh, it's playing, but Perhaps well, technology is not so easy. So I'm going to cut it. Carolina, can we see any video now? Or uh... Well, it was playing. If you don't see it, it's because something went wrong. Uh, I believe you are not able to watch the video. Okay. Don't worry. Can we proceed, please? OK. So, Carolina, shall we proceed or uh, shall we wait? Uh, we no, shall no, proceed. Okay. Well, uh, Paulo, thank you for the presentation. Um, uh, well within the 15 minutes. Um, and uh, now let's move on to Aaron Hoskin. Um, uh, Aaron Hoskin is Senior Manager responsible for federal, provincial and international activities within the Fuel Diversification Division at Natural Resources Canada. He has over 10 years of experience, of experience in fostering greater production and use of low-carbon fuels across the economy. He has led and contributed to the development of various programs and policies aimed to decarbonize Canada's economy. He has a PhD in chemistry with a focus on catalytic activation of small molecules, including hydrogen and methane. Uh, Aaron, the screen is yours. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity. I hope you can all hear me well. Um, it's actually it's snowing here in Ottawa, so uh, I really wish I was with you guys. But um, anyway, and also I was hoping to have some beef on for lunch, but I guess that's not possible either. So. Um, <laughs> So I'll just go through my presentation. Um, so just a brief outline here of what uh, what I'll be presenting. We'll go through kind of Canada's history, um, the history of hydrogen and where everything fits together. Um, the growing interest domestically and internationally on hydrogen and how that fits in with renewable energy, including ocean energy. And then globally, how you know hydrogen in Canada isn't just domestic, it is international as well. And then we'll talk about what's happening next. Um, so 
why hydrogen? I guess the whole game changer for hydrogen came when Canada, or Canada and the world committed to being net zero by 2050. Hydrogen is essential for us to meet those goals. We know that countries around the world and industry around the world are also committing to being net zero by 2050. And that really was the game changer for hydrogen domestically and globally. Global climate action requires an energy transformation, including pathways that can deliver results. And we see hydrogen as a key component of that. Um, it's really the nexus of energy and the environment. It can be used for energy storage, for large-scale, long-term energy storage, and I'll get into multiple um, different applications in a little bit. But this kind of gives a high-level overview of where hydrogen can enter into multiple uh, aspects of the economy, including offshore wind and renewable energy. But this isn't the first time we've heard about hydrogen. Uh, there's been lots of false starts in the past, even you know, 15 years ago. Um, what's different this time, as I mentioned, net zero is a game changer for the hydrogen story. Global energy policies, global energy transformation directly linked to climate change policies and economic growth. There's large opportunities across the country, across Canada and across the world for large-scale hydrogen production to bring economic and environmental benefits. Um, it's flexible end uses now. Technologies have continued to advance and now it's not just about transportation and certainly not just about light-duty passenger vehicles. Um, and now a number of technologies and a number of end uses are actually cost competitive with incumbent technologies by 2030. Um, and strategic partnerships are happening. It's not just the clean tech industry that's interested in hydrogen now. It's pretty much everybody across the value chain, electric and, and gas utilities, clean tech providers, vehicle manufacturers, governments at all levels. Everybody's ready to work together um, to go forward on a hydrogen as part of the global energy transformation. But the hydrogen story is really a Canadian story, and I won't steal the thunder of the next guest um, um, from Opt Hydrogen Optimized because this is really his story. But Canada was at the forefront of hydrogen technologies for more than a century, 115 years or 105 years ago, the world's first large scale patent for large scale industrial hydrogen production was filed in Canada. And that leadership and global activity continued for more than a century. Even 40 years ago, companies like Ballard were at the forefront again of hydrogen fuel cell development. Um, world's first bus in 1995, world's first vehicle fleet. Only 15 years ago, a vehicle fleet of three Ford Focus that had been retrofitted to be running on hydrogen was the world's largest and first vehicle fleet. 15 years ago. Now there's tens of thousands of these vehicles on the roads today. Um, the world's first bus fleet deployment in real large-scale commercial deployment happened in 2010 in, in Canada using Canadian technology. And then the world's first hydrogen fuel cell powered commuter train using Canadian technology again was launched in Germany in 2018. And now there's a number of those uh, commuter trains um, across Europe. But before we get into all that, I just wanted to make sure we're all kind of understanding what the fundamentals of hydrogen is. Um, you can produce hydrogen from a number of, of um, pathways. You can use conventional energy sources like natural gas or coal or petroleum to produce hydrogen. That does produce CO2, but you can link it to carbon abatement technologies like CCUS, carbon capture and storage, for instance, to drive down the carbon intensity. You can link it to renewables, including hydro, off, offshore wind, wind in general, solar, all of these can be used through electrolysis um, to make hydrogen. And when I say electrolysis, if you think back to first year chemistry class or high school chemistry, if you take two electrodes or a, a plug and you stick it in the wall and you put that into water on one, I don't recommend it by the way, that's why my hair is curly, but um, on one you will get oxygen, on the other you get hydrogen. So that process is called electrolysis. On a large scale, you get large scale electrolysis. You can convert biomass to hydrogen, you can capture it as an off gas from a number of industrial processes, and you can produce it from nuclear electricity with uh, through electrolysis as well. Once you make it, you can transform it, you can compress it like other gases, you can push it through natural gas pipelines, which is a plan that both Canada and Portugal have to transport it. Um, it also decarbonizes things. You can compress it and push it on um, and transport it via truck. You can liquefy it and transport it over longer distances as you would other liquid fuels. And you can also convert it to other organic carriers like ammonia or toluene for even larger distances. Once you've made it and you've moved it, how do you use it? Well, you can do the reverse process. Take that hydrogen, react it with oxygen in the presence of a different catalyst, that's a fuel cell, that produces electricity. And then you have electricity where and when you need it in forklifts or cars or mining or buses and light rail and all of these end use applications where you could use conventional electricity, you can use fuel cells. Um, conventional engines, you can actually burn hydrogen um, either as a mixture or purely in a conventional internal combustion engine 
for transportation, for industrial process, or even for power generation in large um, ge electricity generation factory or generation facilities. And it is an essential industrial feedstock for things like oil and gas upgrading, fertilizer production, and steel manufacturing. And so as we drive down the carbon intensity of that hydrogen we're producing, you inherently reduce the carbon footprint of these essential industries, both for Canada, for Portugal, and for the world. Canada has a number of advantages. I touched on some of them, but here are some more. Um, the global market, it's expected to expand to about 11.7 trillion by 2050. I mentioned Canada's global leadership on innovation on this file. Um, a vast majority of global deployment of hydrogen and fuel cell technologies is using some piece of Canadian technology. So even now, if we can capture a small bit of that 11.7 trillion, that's a huge economic opportunity for Canada. We are rich in feedstocks. If you think about all of those pathways I mentioned, we have every single component on that entire value chain to produce low carbon hydrogen from every opportunity. We are a world leading, we have a world leading energy sector. We have 900,000 people currently employed in the energy sector and they can pivot to a low carbon future um, based on hydrogen and other low carbon fuels as well as electrification. We have a head start, I mentioned all those worlds first. We have access to market, we have access to market in Europe, we can, uh, through our east coast, through the Atlantic uh, Ocean, we have access to market in, in Japan and South Korea and other air markets in Asia, and we have direct access into California and the eastern seaboard of the United States where we know there's interest in hydrogen. And as the global momentum grows, we feel we can contribute to this global um, to, to this global momentum. There's opportunities across the entire country. We're vast, but we have opportunities for production and end use across, across the entire country. And the strategy we're working on will really highlight what those opportunities are in the short, medium, and long term and how we can seize those opportunities. We are working on hydrogen strategy. It will have recommendations across the entire value chain, things like strategic partnerships, de-risking investments, codes and standards, innovation, the need to continue to drive down um, the cost, improve efficiencies across the entire value chain, enabling policies like uh, environmental policies or economic policies, awareness, this is everything from fundamentally, if your citizens are gonna be on a fuel cell bus, are they gonna be comfortable sitting on a hydrogen tank, for instance, all the way up to how do you get end users in industry, in the electricity generation, uh, in renewable energy to understand the linkages between hydrogen and their long-term sustainability goals and how do we grow together. How does Canada capture those international markets? How do we become the supplier of choice uh, for clean hydrogen and the technologies to use it? And that's through strong partnerships. And we have a very strong relationship with Portugal um, started over a year ago, and we continue to strengthen those ties. And I said that we had a vast country, and so the strategy itself for the country is high level, but we're complementing that with a series of regional blueprints that delve a level deeper but the rest of the world is moving forward as well. Portugal has plans and a hydrogen strategy. The Netherlands, the European Union, Germany, France, we're all, they're all investing billions of dollars, billions of euro in hydrogen fuel cell technologies. Um, a lot of that fortunately is on the backs of Canadian technology and we want to continue to be at the forefront of that, but we also want to continue to partner with countries like Germany and Portugal and the Netherlands um, and even Chile and Australia and there's opportunities across all of these jurisdictions. Uh, one key slide, uh, piece of this slide as well is that cost competitive um, discussion. The Hydrogen Council, which is a global consortium of, of companies and, and um, industry leaders across the value chain, did a study in 2019 that suggested that hydrogen would be cost competitive with incumbent technologies by 2030 in 22 of 35 end uses, including power generation, long-term energy storage linked with renewables, and mining and, and freight operations. So we're not just working domestically. As I mentioned, our strategy is also internationally focused. And so a year ago in May 2019, we, we came together under the Clean Energy Ministerial. The Clean Energy Ministerial is a global consortium of 26, actually now 27, because Portugal did join um, countries that are working together towards energy transformation in a clean energy or in a low carbon future. Um, those countries represent 90% of global clean energy investments and 75% of CO2 emissions. And the consortium is really working together on policies and programs that we can all do together to drive that energy transformation that we know is essential. Through that initiative, as I mentioned in May 2019, we launched a brand new hydrogen initiative. And this is bringing more than 20 countries together, including Portugal. They joined uh, just this year. 
I'm very thankful for that because there is significant interest in Portugal on hydrogen and linked to renewables. And these are the countries that are all working together to ensure that hydrogen is part of that global energy discussion and hydrogen's role in a global energy transformation is on the radar of energy ministers around the world. The hydrogen initiative um, has a number of working groups, including clean cities, um, twin cities, where we bring cities across the world that are interested in hydrogen to come together to share experiences and best practices, uh, working groups on clean production and distribution. And this is really, there's even a working group that's looking at Portugal's interest uh, in partnering with the Netherlands, for instance, or Australia partnering with Japan, and Canada is ready to partner with pretty much anybody to provide that clean hydrogen and the, that the technologies to use it. Transportation, ports, industry, all of these working groups are coming together. Um, and we recently held a, a hydrogen a nuclear in, um, workshop webinar in February 2020 that really looked at the nexus between clean energy production through nuclear and hydrogen production. Um, there's also a working group under IRENA, the International Renewable Energy uh, Association, that is also looking at the direct interplay between renewable energies and hydrogen, and we're directly feeding into that process as well. Strategic partnerships are the heart of this. It's all about working together. Um, it's all about sharing activities, and the partnerships aren't just working government to government. It's government and industry as well. We know industry is ready and already investing, and so we need to harness all of our global investments as we look to building back better and push forward on hydrogen as part of that clean energy mix. I'll be honest, it's not the only part. There's low carbon fuels that are, will play a role and electrification will play a role, but hydrogen is at the foremount of that as well. And going forward, um, we continue to build the SEM initiative, the Clean Energy Ministerial Hydrogen Initiative, as well as our domestic activities. We are finalizing the strategy itself, which will identify those opportunities and how we need to work together, what we need to do in the short, medium, and long term to seize those opportunities, to cement Canada's role um, in building those international partnerships as well. And we look forward to continuing to work with Portugal and other countries as we grow the global momentum on hydrogen. And with that, I will end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Aaron. Um... You also saved us some minutes, and thank you for the clear, the clear presentation. Um, okay, so now let's move on to Edward Stewart. Um, Edward? Hello. To the panel. Uh, so, um, Edward uh, is the Vice President of Product Strategy for Hydrogen Optimized. Uh, Edward Stewart co-founded Hydrogen Optimized in 2017 with a vision to enable economic hydrogen production using renewable energy. Edward, please go Hi. ahead. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. I'm just setting up my uh, slideshow here. Is it visible? Yes. Uh, Perfect. But, yeah, yeah. Great. Now it's in presentation mode. Perfect. Great. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me to speak today at uh, this seminar. So today I'm going to be talking about why hydrogen, what is hydrogen being used for, and how hydrogen connect with wind and floating PV, tidal energy, and other sources of energy that can be found on the ocean. Historic hydrogen industry context and an introduction to hydrogen optimize and our rugged cell electrolysis systems. It's a great honor to be speaking today. The last conference that we attended before COVID hit was in Portugal, and it is a shame that uh, we're not able to be there today, but uh, it's still uh, very uh, nice to uh, present virtually. So why hydrogen? Governments and companies around the world are trying to bridge two industries, green industry supply and actually demand of traditional fuels such as oil, gas, and coal. Uh, direct electrification works in a lot of settings, but it doesn't work in every setting. Uh, things like, uh, especially in industry demand and some mobility applications, uh, there's the economic solutions for direct electrification aren't there. Our company, we're focused on helping bridge this gap between green electricity supply and traditional fuel demand. There's big pushes from this, uh, whether it be from the economic reports done by Goldman Sachs and Bank of America, both identifying this as a $10 trillion scale industry in the next 50 years, in the next 30 years, pardon me, 
uh, as well from the capital markets with ESG and other uh, capital pressures forcing uh, companies to move towards green alternatives rather than uh, traditional production technologies. Um, and this really leads to why not electricity direct? Uh, a lot of the applications, such as ammonia, methanol, steel, petrochemical, refining of oils, uh, and natural gas blending or replacement, uh, there's no direct electric alternative which is feasible. Uh, a lot of these industries, you can't just plug your electricity production directly into the end use. You need some sort of conversion technology to enable these industries to decarbonize. Additionally, why hydrogen for mobility? In short, one of the main features of hydrogen is hydrogen is the lightest element. Uh, it's around three times as energy dense as uh, diesel um, and can be stored in large quantities much easier than uh, alternative technologies for um, greening of certain applications. Uh, let's put it out front, particularly in heavy industry and large scale mobility, whether it be for mining, busing, trains, trucking, and as we're really exploring now uh, in the marine sector and shipping. Uh, these are just a handful of some of the actually made and operating hydrogen in watercraft as well as uh, hydrogen watercraft which are under construction or in uh, concept mode. Uh, it's, it's really identified as one of the best alternative technologies to decarbonize uh, marine transportation of all forms, whether it be tugboats in Amsterdam or liquid hydrogen transportation in Asia uh, or ferries in Norway. There are several projects around the world uh, that range between all these different sectors that have seen hydrogen adoption in uh, marine transport. So this takes to the overall big picture. It's between government mandates and private sector push. There's a large new demand for green hydrogen supply. Uh, 20 gigawatts alone is, is a conservative estimate for the next uh, 10 years. Uh, recently, uh, a single player has announced over 200 gigawatts of large scale projects. Um, so, where is all this electricity going to come from to supply this? Particularly in markets like Europe, we have to look to the ocean, to offshore wind, to floating PVs, to tidal, and other technologies which are both mature and developing to harness the, the ocean's uh, electricity to enable. Uh, both ocean applications of hydrogen as well as land applications of hydrogen uh, in a plethora of sectors, which is really forming uh, one of the key pillars of uh, global decarbonization efforts. Uh, hydrogen has several large beneficial wind integrations to optimize the solution. It can be placed near or inside of wind turbines, the electrolyzer that is, to convert the electricity into hydrogen which in large case, in many cases, can reduce the complexity of the wind equipment and reduce the cost of electricity uh, because of that, such as uh, converting cabling into hydrogen pipelines. Um, there's two main business models for uh, hydrogen production, uh, and then a plethora of combinations between them. Uh, off-peak curtailment, which is utilizing the, the off-peak loads, which might be surplus from wind turbines and other renewable technologies where it's not dispatchable, the electricity production, uh, taking advantage of these off-peak loads and, uh, and increasing the amount of electricity into the electrolyzers at these times, and then using storage or other technologies to buffer that, growing the applications demand the, the hydrogen, or base load systems where it's steady state and base loads. And of course, there's numerous potentials between those two extremes in an economic scenario for electrolyzer systems. Uh, but both of these business models, whether it be grid stability and uh, creating a market for off-peak power of, mo of the business model A, or increasing baseload demand, um, will increase demand for ocean power. Not to mention uh, microgrids, which might connect directly from uh, ocean power generation to uh, electrolyzers without even involving the utility service. So that's a bit of the overview on hydrogen, and here's a bit of market context and history. Uh, thank you, Aaron, for a bit of the uh, introduction, tip of the iceberg on uh, our past involvement in the industry and my family's past involvement in the industry in our 115 year history, which dates from the top left to the initial large scale commercial electrolyzers of uh, 
uh, just after World War I, uh, to developing and optimizing solutions of thousands of electrolyzers deployed in hundreds of countries through the 1950s to 90s, and as well as developing what is still to this day the world's largest single electrolysis cell and largest single circuit uh, electrolysis systems. Then into the 1990s, where uh, we pioneered the concept of small packaged fueling appliances uh, for the growing fueling industry, which has been the pr predominant focus of the industry for the past 20 years, and did some of the early pioneering work on renewable connections, particularly solar. Uh, so this is our, at least my family's personal background, where we gain a lot of our insights to the industry and what's required for different market contexts in the industry. Um, but it really goes much further to that and to, to the present context. From the 1930s to the 1960s, this hundreds of megawatt scale market uh, existed. It wasn't too common, but there was the odd project uh, a one a year or so in the time frame that required such equipment. Uh, but in the early 1990s, the market didn't just disappear in the hundreds of megawatts, but it collapsed even in the uh, above five megawatt type scale, which resulted to little to no demand in that uh, frame of uh, equipment. And the presence OEMs have optimized for small units until very least recently to match historic market requirements. Uh, but the large scale market is a fundamentally different market that requires a different way of thinking on what an electrolyzer is. Uh, just to some numbers to back up these statements, the, according to a Witten McKenzie report, over the past 20 years, only 250 megawatts of systems have been installed, uh, which largely consists of under one megawatt systems. So it's a very different market when we start talking about hundreds of megawatts in single systems, uh, and even gigawatts in some cases that we're beginning conversations with. So this brings us to Hydrogen Optimize. In 2017, uh, myself and my father, Andrew Stewart, saw this problem between te existing technology and where the industry was heading, uh, and began Hydrogen Optimize to develop and commercialize new large-scale water electrolyzers, which were well-suited to the large-scale industry. We have a strong team built around experience in the industry and new talent. And as I mentioned before, we have a strong background in understanding industry history and developing and commercializing technology, ranging from over a thousand projects in a hundred countries undertaken by my family historically. So, into the modern hydrogen technology advances. The rugged cell scalable water electrolyzer, we believe, is, is poised to become a category leading technology in the 10 megawatt to 1 gigawatt scale for green hydrogen supply. We have several patents and the overall design of the equipment is pretty novel. And we have a focus on large scale, long equipment lifetimes, low capital cost, easy deployable modern manufacturing, infrequent system maintenance, high system efficiency, compact footprints, and ability to connect and integrate better with renewables. And we hope to become uh, a category leader in each of these uh, features. And are working to, uh, as Aaron put it, the, there's projections for electrolysis and hydrogen to be cost competitive by 2030. Our objective is to move up that date towards 2021, um, when our system will become much more commercially deployable and available to the market. ABB and Hydrogen Optimized, uh, ABB announced recently a joint MOU signed between our two companies in August and announced in September, uh, where the objective of this MOU is to make green hydrogen financially feasible option across all industries and applications. Uh, in this MOU, it, it includes the development of a, and joint commercialization of large scale systems in the hundreds of megawatts in single plant size, uh, as well as the demonstration of such a system. Presently, we're engaging with the market with our product and, and deployment opportunities. So why is it, what's something about our technology which makes it stand out from the other current OEMs in the industry and what's novel about it? Uh, it's really our high ampere approach. To get large power, you need high amperes. Most conventional technologies are, are limited uh, to uh, uh, single digit thousands of amperes, uh, while we're focusing on into the hundreds of thousands of amperes with our technology. Uh, and this is standard across a lot of the major uh, electrochemical industries, whether it be uh, aluminum uh, or chloralkali. And this is really where we created a uh, 
a, a joint vision with ADB in terms of they were searching the world for an electrolyzer, which really looked at high amperes because that's just the standard best practice uh, for all other power intensive industries. And they were pretty confused on why such an approach wasn't being deployed in the electrolysis industry, which has been applied in every other major electro electrochemical industry. Uh, and that's where joint collaboration is really focusing on. So summary and conclusion from all this. Due to the falling cost of electricity from the technologies of production we've been discussing, and, elect and uh, green, the electricity demand is going to be in a high gigawatt scale for hydrogen due to the falling cost of green electricity as well as the increasing demand for low carbon hydrogen. Offshore and floating electricity generation will be required in, in, to generate much of this power, particularly in Europe, where there's not many other available power resources. And now is the time to begin collaboration, deployment, and demonstration of these systems to enable scaling to meet the government targets and economic targets set out, um, such as the ones that Eric, uh, Aaron were mentioning. Uh, and that's it from me. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Thank you, Edward. Thank you, and uh, I think we are okay with time. We we uh, achieved our targets uh, of of, uh, of keeping 15 minutes uh, for questions. Um, I would I would like that all the presenters could switch on their cameras, please, um, and. Um, and I, I would start with the first question to to Miguel Patena. Um, do you do you do you see those difficulties? Not difficulties, but those idiosyncrasies of of the of the um, hybridization only for Portugal or for other geographies. And uh, how do you see hydrogen uh, in in those in 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 those energy mixes you you showed us? Okay, thank you for the question. Is the um, hybridization is um, is a question raised by everywhere in the world, where if we have these assets that are not um, fully used or they, they they do not use at full load the the transmission lines, there's an opportunity for hybridization. And normally, what you're doing by this is that you are decreasing investment and creating opportunities for I call it. Um, uh, um, technologies that have a, a higher LCOE, a higher energy cost. So this could be an opportunity because you are decreasing now, normally the connection point cost. And so with all in uh, all the world, this uh, hybridization is a, how I call it is a, a buzzword that is uh, uh, being challenged by by several. We have several examples for wind and solar, for instance, hybridization. In EDP, and we have this uh, project for floating PV. And of course, it is a niche. Floating PV is a good opportunity because if if floating PV is competing with conventional PV, only with this niche opportunities will have a, uh, will have a possibility to to be able to compete. About hydrogen, I forgot. Uh, so, um, I am responsible within EDP Produção in the EDP company for the one gigawatt project in Cines. So I'm glad I heard the, my colleagues here talking about hydrogen and perhaps some particularities of the green hydrogen in Europe category means that you have to have additional renewables exclusively for the hydrogen production uh, and in a self-consumption mode. It means that all the energy produced by these uh, renewable assets has to be used for the hydrogen in order to be able to be considered as green hydrogen. Of course, the regulation is going is probably to be changed because that's make uh, perhaps an investment uh, or an or efficient world it doesn't make uh, much sense. And uh, you can use grid connection as long as you have certification of the of the green energy resource. So um, as an excellent opportunity, and as Edward mentioned about this stable conditions for the the, the resource wind plays an important role and so we have looked for the offshore opportunities to be connected to our project in Cines. but the problem in, in Cines is that the wind resource offshore is not as good as, as in the north as we've seen in our colleagues so 
life is hard and it provides us all these challenges. But this, uh, of course, we have to go through all these um, possibilities to make the hydrogen cost the lowest, lowest as possible. So, okay, it. thank you. Um, now, uh, um, uh, uh, questions from our audience. Uh, a question for Kendra and Aaron from Naima Krauser Friesen. Sorry for the pronunciation. Uh, um, what specific ocean sectors are most prominent or have the most potential currently to be developed in the Canadian Arctic Ocean? Who wants to, to grab this? Is it too general? It's got to be <laughs> Kendra, that's you. We are not hearing you. So the question is, what, I will repeat the question. What specific ocean sectors are most prominent or have the most potential currently to be developed in the Canadian Arctic Ocean? Uh, okay. uh, yeah, we cannot hear you. Well, let's move on to another question. Uh, sorry, sorry, Naima. Um, uh, so now uh, a question from. Uh, yes, sorry. yes. Sorry, I was muted by the organizer. So I'm not sure what I did, but sorry. Um, <laughs> so I mean, I think in the Arctic, the Arctic is, a, is an interesting question. Uh, right now, we're seeing a lot of security activity. Maybe not surprising, as the Arctic is is opening up and what that means uh, for various countries. Uh, we're seeing an increase in uh, tourism, right, and, and cruise ships, and then that creates complexity around, um, you know, whether or not, like, this is, this is a new area, and then what are the emergency services if those cruise ships get into trouble, and what does that increase in volume of activity actually mean? We're also seeing an increase in some of the mining activity in the north on land, but to get it out comes by sea. And so what that means for invasive species. Um, and, and so I think it's, uh, there, there's lots of potential, but I think there's also lots of consideration for the impact already in terms of climate change and how fast that's impacting the North. And um, obviously taking into consider consideration as well, indigenous peoples, and then what the, the balance of what we can do and what we should do in terms of impacts on the Arctic. Okay, let's move on to another question. Um, so, a question from Philippe Pared. Um, a question to Harry and Aaron. In the long term, would you expect that the hydrogen market will behave more closely to the natural gas one, with few regions countries producing it and exporting it to several intaker countries? Our hydrogen production will be far more spread and leaning towards self-sufficient regions, countries in general. Who wants to take it? I don't know. Do you want to go first, Aaron? I have a few comments on this. Um, I think it's kind of be, going to be a mixture of both. I think, uh, especially if, um, well, I guess one one piece that that Canada has been working on with governments around the world is focusing not on labeling hydrogen production technology, so not green or brown or blue or yellow, and Miguel, this gets to your point as well, it's actually about the carbon intensity. So the production you use shouldn't matter, it should actually be how carbon intense is that hydrogen. And I think if that's what we do globally, and that's certainly what's happening, we're working to certify production pathways or to certify methodology to determine that carbon intensity, then that, open up, that opens up opportunities in pretty much every jurisdiction um, based on whatever feedstock they have. Yes, there's going to be some jurisdictions and some countries that have pretty much every opportunity on every single pathway to produce hydrogen, um, but but it will there will be opportunities in more jurisdictions than just where you have natural gas reserves because basically all you need is clean electricity or a carbon source with carbon abatement. Um, the other piece that you also need to have is clean clean water and access to clean water, and I think that's going to be more the limiting factor um, than than would be the pathway that you choose but I'll pass it to, uh, to, to Hydrogen Optimized. 
Uh, apologies to the confusion. I'm on a colleague's computer, so I'm t I'm Edward here, but uh, it's mislabeled. But uh, anyways, so my two cents on the subject is that, uh, uh, like Aaron, I think there's going to be a mixture. But really, you're seeing with solar and wind uh, is the native forms of energy across much of the world. And as solar, wind, and hydrogen and electrolysis technologies progress, what I really believe that we're going to be seeing is large-scale distributed hydrogen with this large-scale generation, but at the location of point source, uh, or very near to the location of point source, due to the uh, the costs of uh, transportation, uh, and as opposed to the natural gas industry, where you have limited deposits, or you have to go to those deposits for production, um, the the deposits equivalent for hydrogen is the sun and the wind. Of course, there's areas where sun and the wind is stronger and brighter, but there's going to be a good mixture in between the two of them, in my opinion. Okay, so now a question for Paulo. Um, Wevec is coordinating the project Blue Cow with IST, Caimanair, Rota Grega and Cecil, which is a study of a wave energy platform to provide energy to an offshore aquaculture farm south of Algarve in a region as a source. It would be easier to design an adequate wave energy device comparatively to Algarve's area where the energy resource is lower. We would be happy to exchange on the subject outside of the questions, outside of the session. Okay, so it's, it's more a comment. It's more of a comment. But um, uh, there's another comment for you, Paulo. Uh, this time, really a question: What power you need to supply energy to the aquaculture farm? Any offshore wind plant in that area? This is from uh, Francisco Royano. The previous one was from Benedict Domergue. Domergue. You, you you have to switch on your microphone, Paulo. You're muted. Okay. Nope. Oh, can't hear. Good. Okay. Okay. I didn't get the final part of the question. Sorry, the second one. Uh, the one by Julian. Just, he's just asking. If there's a wind plan, uh, an offshore wind plan in that area? Well, yes. Uh, the problem is that the winds in that area are most of the time so strong that uh, we were never able to, to use them. I would go for, a, for another form of energy uh, apart from wind. Actually, it's not a, a big deal, but uh, it's uh, big enough to. Uh, I wouldn't think that solar energy would go, neither wind energy. Well, wind could work, but uh, it, it's very. Um, it, it's not a balanced uh, area where we have wind wind conditions every time. Either we have too much or we have none, which is. It, it can be a, a, a big challenge to go to the wind uh, condition, but we can study it. Uh, the first part of the question was, what power do you need to supply energy to the aquaculture farm? Well, um, we are using diesel engines now, so I can give you now the... the we using about... Uh, 20 liters, 20 liters of diesel for each ton produced. It's not much, but it's really what uh, makes us linked to the to the land. If we can survive just with offshore energy, we would have a much more independent uh, exploration. Uh, Paulo, uh, just out of my curiosity. What is the depth range to install that cage? Well, minimum of 50 meters. We are now on a range that goes from the 80 to 100 meters. But uh, since the cage is about 25 meters high, we need to submerge it at least 20 meters. So to be on the safe side of uh, the wave energy. So we need to have at least 50 meters we have more than that we have the the shallower part of our concession is about 60 meters and the deeper part is about 120 meters 
because how many as you know in Azores it's a steep um, bottom it's, it's, I mean we 500 meters from the coastline we have already uh, 100 meters deep okay and how many tons will you be producing next next year for instance uh, next year? Um, initial production it's around 50 tons but uh, it can triple in this same cage uh, we estimate that in three years we may be producing a thousand tons with the, the the upgrade and of course it's for that for that time that i need the energy and not for this uh, small scale production Okay, uh, Carolina, um, give us some guidance. We've reached uh, the time. I still have some questions here. I don't know if um, if I should put them or uh, or should we end here? Uh, hi, Jose. So uh, I will say that that's the this is the end. Okay. Thank you, Jose. Thank you all.